Good morning and welcome back to I'll Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mari of Drea Renee Knits and today I am wearing my sparky sweater complete with cute little pockets. And this is where I try my very best to answer some of your questions. I have some pretty fun ones picked out today and then I have a very special announcement at the end. So make sure to stay tuned for that. All right, so let's start with the first question here. This one's about gauge. If I was able to get gauge for a sweater pattern using DK yarn, and then another pattern is using worsted weight yarn, but has the same exact gauge, would I be getting gauge for both patterns with my DK yarn? Can patterns, sweaters specifically, have the same gauge, but use different weights of yarn? This confuses me. So yeah, if you, there's a lot to consider here. So my first question would be, how did the designer list the gauge in the pattern? So what I'm meaning there is how were you meant to knit your gauge swatch? So for instance, for all of my patterns, I'm going to have you knit your swatch either flat or in the round, depending on how I knit that piece. So in general, a lot of my sweaters are knit in the round. Um, I tend to do more pullovers than say cardigans. So I am going to list that gauge in the round because your gauge will change depending on if you're knitting flat or knitting in the round for most knitters. So if both of those patterns you're looking at have the same, you're swatching the same way. So let's say you are doing, it's two different sweaters and they both want you to swatch in the round and you got gauge with that DK, then you could absolutely use it for both of those patterns because you got gauge. And to answer your follow-up question about can um, patterns have the same gauge but use different weights of yarn? Absolutely, because we all knit differently and it's all dependent on not only yarn weight, but needle size and the knitter. So somebody else might get gauge with a worsted weight at a specific needle size that you can then achieve that gauge using a DK weight with maybe a bigger needle size. So you might be able to use a lighter weight yarn on a bigger needle to achieve the same gauge that somebody else might get using a thicker yarn with a smaller needle. So that's why doing a gauge swatch is so important. Um, I've mentioned this before, but Clara Parks has a class where she'll have everybody in the room use the same yarn and same needles and knit the same amount of stitches and every single swatch in that room will be a different size. So it's so dependent on how we knit and the tools we're using and the yarn we're using, especially because one place I noticed a uh, big discrepancy too can be how that yarn was spun. So that'll really change how much yarn you need if it was worsted or woolen spun and you're trying to go by weight because a woolen spun yarn is gonna be a lot lighter in weight than a worsted spun yarn, which is gonna be heavier, doesn't have as much air in it. So all of that plays a role. The important takeaway is swatching is really important <laughs> and getting gauge and I always say, I do get quite a few questions from people saying, I want to use this yarn. It's not the right, the correct weight called for in the pattern. Can I still use it? To which my response is, I can't guarantee your outcome if you choose to go like way off from what I recommend in a pattern. But what's important is, are you achieving gauge so that you know that the dimensions will be correct at the end? And that's mostly important for items that need to fit a certain part of your body a certain way. But also do you like the fabric it creates? So if you're trying to use a heavier yarn, let's say a worsted weight yarn and a pattern that calls for maybe a DK weight, and maybe you can get gauge by going down a needle size, but what has that done to your fabric? Is it giving you a really stiff kind of tight fabric? And do you like that? Or 
flip side of that, trying to use maybe a fingering weight in a pattern that calls for a DK weight. Now, do you have a really open, airy, holy fabric? And do you like that? Is it gonna have the stability you need for what you're making? So it's really important when we are working on our projects that we're creating fabrics we like at the intended gauge so that we know it's gonna turn out the way we want it to turn out. So. I hope that answered your question. I kind of went off on some side tangents there, but gauge is a big topic. I mean, that's why there's entire classes that have to do with gauge. Um, but the more you do it, the more you're also gonna learn about how you where you end up kind of on that spectrum if you're a tighter knitter or a looser knitter i've spoken before about how needle material can play a really big part in that too um, metal needles tend to give us a little more slip so we tend to knit a little looser with a metal needle so if you struggle with maybe always being a little too tight for gauge you might want to try a metal needle um, wood needles tend to give us a little more grip they hold on to the yarn a bit more and so those are going to help tighten up a looser gauge um, and obviously yarn choice is also going to be a huge factor in there but there's lots of little bits that all come together so it's kind of finding what works best for you and the patterns you're choosing to knit question number two how do you avoid pooling so pooling generally comes from a, like a variegated yarn that has bigger this is not like a fabulous word to use, but like blotches of color, like bigger amounts of color in different areas. So less speckly, more big chunks of color that was dyed onto the yarn. And when you knit up, sometimes you'll get these big sections of pooling. I unfortunately, having no background in dyeing yarn, don't understand the aspect of pooling very well. I can't really help you determine how to know when that's gonna happen except for in general I've only ever experienced it with very variegated yarn so to me in my head it kind of looks to me almost like camo um, on the skein you know like really big kind of blotches of different color I'm so sorry I keep using that word um, but I'm sure that dyers would have a much more eloquent way to describe that color placement um, so if you don't like pooling, I would probably kind of just be really aware if you are choosing a variegated yarn that that may happen. Um, you're probably gonna have better luck with maybe like a speckled tonal yarn um, if you really like like a playful, colorful yarn but wanna avoid the pooling. Um, your other option there is to break it up. So to break it up, you basically need to use, even stitch patterns I find don't always hide pooling, so it would be more like stripes. Um, you could use two skeins of the same colorway and stripe that to break up that pooling, or um, you could actually just use it as stripes, like bring in a whole other fun yarn that you like with that other one, um, and that would help. So. That's probably the only tip I have is striping. And um, the more you play with different yarns, the more you're gonna kind of learn how they behave. So if you really love variegated yarns, really pay attention. A good idea that I've actually started doing with my spinning is I like to lay the fiber out that's been dyed by somebody else. I lay it out before spinning it and I take a picture. And then after I'm done spinning it, I take a picture. And that is helping to teach me, oh, okay, this was the color placement on that fiber and this is what it spun into. So you could absolutely translate that to your knitting where I would untwist the skein of yarn so it's just in its open loop and take a picture of that so you can see what that color placement looks like. And then when you're done knitting with it, take a picture of that finished object and that way you can kind of see, okay, when the yarn had color applied this way, this is when I saw that pooling happen in my knitting. So now I know if I'm at a yarn shop or whatever it may be shopping for yarn, if you're doing it in person and you have the ability to maybe open that skein up, you can kind of see, oh, okay, this might be when that would occur. So I'm gonna buy two skeins so I can stripe them and break up that pooling. And the tricky thing is too, from what I've found, and if there's dyers out there who want to weigh in on this, please feel free to jump into the comments and kind of share some knowledge with us. Um, but what I find tricky is it also matters how big 
whatever you are knitting is. So I've had, I've worked with variegated yarns that were totally fine for the whole body. And then all of a sudden one sleeve had like this big section of pooling because it went down to a smaller circumference. And that is just the way the yarn landed um, as I was knitting it. So that's something to kind of consider too, um, that it can be tricky planning for it that way. And that's why I would recommend having that extra skein where if you notice some pooling, you could always tear back a little bit and begin alternating. Um, rows or rounds with the other skein to avoid the pooling. But then you might end up with a stripey thing. I mean, it kind of depends on what you want it to look like. All right, next question. I recently finished the Ginny sweater and fell in love with it. I'm so happy you liked it. And then, so they started the Spark sweater. I purchased the pattern when it was first released, but put off making it because of a terrible mental block I have when it comes to sticking. You are not alone in that fear. <laughs> in an effort to grow as a knitter, I started the Spark and am now to the point where I'm adding the sleeves to the body and know that sticking isn't far off. So my question to you is, do you know of a good tutorial on sticking? Is there a technique that you prefer over another? I get physically nauseous when I think about cutting my knitting and any and all help would be greatly appreciated. Um, so again, you're not alone in your fears about cutting your knitting. I mean, I think we kind of have that drilled into us with, as new knitters, like be careful with your sisters near your knitting. But at the end of the day, it's just knitting. It's going to be okay. And once you do it, it's really fun and it will free you a little bit from that fear of cutting it. I mean, you're going to be like, what can I cut now? The cool thing is like, even right now, if I decided I want the, this to be a cardigan, I could literally reinforce this and cut it open. So I believe you should find a link in the Spark Cardi tutorial um, pattern for a tutorial on sticking, one of my favorites, I think is very thorough, is Tin Can Knits has a whole blog post on sticking. So that is what I would recommend checking out and I'm pretty sure it's linked in that pattern. Um, but if you are scared, my number one tip is to do it on the swatch first. It's gonna make you feel a lot better. It's gonna give you practice. It will definitely give you the confidence to do it. That's how I first staked is I just knit up a funky little, uh, there's a video of it. You can find it on my YouTube channel. Um, and it will just make you feel a lot better about the whole process. I highly recommend if you have a sewing machine, if you are feeling nervous, I really like doing a crocheted reinforcement. So even if I'm gonna do a sewn, reinforcement using my sewing machine. I actually still do my crochet reinforcement. Maybe that's unnecessary, but I find that the crochet reinforcement, it just makes it visually a lot easier for me to see where I'm gonna be cutting and I like the process of it. But when I've gotten nervous or if I am using a superwash yarn that doesn't have that grip of a non-superwash and I'm worried about something at some point popping out, then I will just do um, a big zigzag stitch on my sewing machine and I just run it right over that crochet reinforcement. And that's worked really well for me. So my stone crop cardigan that I showed in the last episode when I did my little like going down memory lane for my old Rhinebeck sweaters, um, that stone crop cardi, I did both a crochet and a sewn reinforcement on that one. And it's been great. I've had it for a few years now, no problems, um, no no weird little yarns popping or unraveling or anything. So practice on a swatch, check out that blog post by Tin Can Knits, and I promise it's gonna be fun. Like once you do it, you'll feel like superwoman, like I can do anything. So uh, yeah, it'll be fine, I promise. Just practice first and you'll feel better about it. All right. I love your podcast. Thank you. I'm curious how you come up with the names of, for your patterns. Why is your new sweater called Illuminate? Thanks. So I find naming patterns incredibly hard. Um, there's a few that the name will come right from the get-go, which I'm always really happy when that happens because it's not like the week before the release and I'm like, oh no, I haven't thought of a name yet. Um, but 
you may have noticed I tend to do a lot of naming contests. So I actually like went way back in my Instagram feed and I had a naming contest for the first pattern I ever released because yeah, I don't find it very easy. So some just come with the name, which is a relief. When they don't, I will often ask others to help me. And Illuminate is one of them. That was actually my very good friend, Kate Berge of Spin Cycle Yarns came up with that idea because she's the one that noticed how that um, magpie feather, their mohair, I paired that with Spin Cycle Yarns Nocturne. So if you haven't been able to see Nocturne yet, it is kind of the moody sister to their core yarn dyed in the wool. And it's dyed over a gray base. So it's a lot moodier and darker. And Kate was looking at those colors and she was like, man, the mohair adds this like ethereal glow and really brings out some of the tones in the nocturne that you might not have noticed. And so she was the one who was like, it like illuminates it. So that is where that name came from. Um, I think I've maybe shared about I think I, in the last episode, even talked about my husband's nickname is Spicy Pete because he likes incredibly spicy food. And so that helped name the last year's Rybeck sweaters, um, which ended up being Spark and Spice. And then everything thereafter kind of was just a riff on that. This is Sparky. There's the Spark socks, the Flicker and Flame hat. Um, so yeah, a lot of times I have I have friends helping me or I spend a lot of time uh, on the internet looking at thesaurus <laughs> guides for the words, uh, but it's not easy for me. For those that have really funny, clever names, I applaud you. Uh, sometimes I wish that came easier to me, but there you go. That is the story behind Illuminate and some of my names. All right, last question. Uh, when knitting in the round with magic loop, how do you avoid a ladder when switching to the next needle? I've tried pulling the yarn tight and unfortunately I'm still getting a ladder, especially on the purl side. My first attempt at magic loop was with your slippers and they came up perfectly, but now I'm knitting a cardigan with a finer wool. Could this be why I'm having trouble? Um, yeah, so it could be, I met, Sorry, I just stuck on that last little bit of the question when you said, could it be the finer wool? It definitely, you might be just noticing it more because your gauge, um, especially compared between slippers, you're gonna knit at a tighter gauge so that they hold up a bit better. Then possibly a sweater, a cardigan might be knit at a looser gauge, especially with a finer wool. So you just might be, there's more air. You can probably see the ladder better. So my first tip for this, which would happen no matter if it was magic loop or um, double pointed, it'll actually happen hopefully less with magic loop because you don't have as many gaps that could ladder. Um, but the best tip I've ever heard that seems to be very consistent is it's not that first stitch after you jump the gap that you really need to tug on. It's actually the second stitch. So go ahead and you're going to your new needle, you knit that first stitch, give it a, a nice tug, but once that second stitch, that is where I've heard that the tension issue actually happens that causes the laddering. Um, outside of that, that still sometimes some people still feel like they're laddering. Um, keep in mind, blocking might really help. I. I don't generally have issues with laddering anymore, but I know I have in the past, but I feel like even if I went through all of my projects, I probably wouldn't be able to find the ladder. So blocking and wearing will a lot of times shift things into place. Um, so try not to worry about it too, too much. But another great way that you can deal with it is by juggling those stitches around as you go. So if it's not super important to keep a set amount of stitches. So like when I'm doing a sleeve, I don't make sure I have half on each needle for my magic loop. I just kind of bend it somewhere in the half and make that my gap. So it's not a big deal if it's laddering, let's say on, you know, this area of your sleeve. I would just 
every once in a while I would pull my needle through and take what would have been the first stitch on the new needle over to my other one and that will move where the possibility of laddering is happening around and you can just kind of do that throughout kind of juggling it around so that you don't just have one big long ladder it will just help hide that issue i hope that makes sense the way i'm describing it um, but that's what i would recommend if tugging on the second stitch doesn't help you but definitely try tugging on the second stitch and see if that works all right, so today for the bonus question, it's not really a question. Oh, I did want to share something. So two things. I've got a little show and tell um, with, I love that some of you enjoyed seeing my spinning last week. So I've also been playing with, I had got a drum carter. So this is one of my first bats. And I feel like I've learned a lot. I'm actually gonna run this back through my drum carter. Um, because I have some recycled sorry silk in here and I've already spun up I made this was turned into three bats out of three ounces of Cormo and then I added some um this is just like mohair this bright pink and then this sorry silk is right here so I've already spun up one of them and it's pretty rough um, there's some of the silk is still really like in a clump. So I think I need to run it through again to kind of help blend it a little bit better, but definitely a big learning curve. I'm excited to get better at it, but I'm pretty excited. It's really fun. And these are really, really fluffy and soft. Um, but in very exciting news, it's my birthday this weekend, and this is the one time a year that I always do a big annual birthday sale. So you can right now save 38% off on all of my independently published patterns on either my website, DreyaReneeKnits.com, or in my Ravelry shop with the code 38 is great, all caps one word, no spaces. And that is good through next Thursday, which is August 5th at midnight Eastern Standard Time. You do wanna make sure to pop that code in before you finish your purchase because discounts cannot be added retroactively. Um, but I hope if there was any of my patterns you've been wanting to snag that you can take advantage of it now with uh, the biggest discount of the year. So I hope you all have a great weekend. I hope you get some making in there, maybe some sewing, some knitting, some spinning. That's what I'm hoping to do. And I'll see you next week. Happy knitting.